As daily coronavirus infections rise in South Africa, concerns are rising over the onset of a fourth wave of the pandemic in that country and the rest of Africa. The new coronavirus variant Omicron has now become dominant in South Africa and is driving a sharp increase in new infections. The new variant has been detected in at least 24 countries around the world, according to the World Health Organization. And persons previously infected with other variants of coronavirus do not appear to be protected from Omicron. But the UN Secretary General and the African Union have said testing should be used instead of travel restrictions. It's ongoing to know whether the Omicron variant is more contagious, cause severe illness or has an impact on vaccine efficacy. Each emergence is a stark reminder that we must double down our curving COVID-19 transmission. An increased number of countries are reporting the new variant since it was first sequenced in South Africa. Ghana and Nigeria have become the latest African country to detect Omicron. Globally, more than 20 countries have now reported the new variant. It is expected that the Omicron variant will be detected in more countries as national authorities set up surveillance and sequencing operations. In Africa, the detection of Omicron variant is coinciding with 54% surge in COVID-19 infection. Um, it should be noted that it is mostly in Southern Africa. While new COVID-19 cases are rising in Southern Africa, they have dropped in all other sub-regions during the past week compared with the previous week. The ongoing investigation will be key to determining whether this spike is driven by Omicron variant or other factors. In South Africa, where WSO has already a team working in genomic sequencing, we are deploying a surge team in Gauteng projects to support surveillance and contact tracing. As other interventions such as infection prevention and treatment measure. In Botswana, we are providing technical assistance to boost the production and distribution of medical oxygen. The organization is also mobilizing $12 million to support critical response activities in countries across the region for the next three months. Meanwhile, the head of South Africa's Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 says there were promising signs over the ability of vaccines to protect against the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. Professor Barry Shop stressed it was early days, around a week on since the country first identified the variant. It's still early days, and I think we need to reserve judgment on that. Certainly, in, the, in this early stage, the news does look to be promising. Uh, the great majority of the breakthrough infection, in other words, individuals that have had infection despite vaccination, uh, is mild. Um, uh, our hospital surveillance uh, is showing a little bit of an uptick, uh, but certainly nothing as dramatic as we've seen uh, in the previous waves. So it does portend well, but I think it still is early days. You know, we have only had this virus around for, what, just over a week. So uh, I think we, we really need to watch the space. I think it's an overreaction. I think it's the wrong reaction. Uh, I'll tell you why, because I think that this virus is already, uh, already spread along many countries around the world before it was detected in South Africa. And I think this really kind of uh, is it's a punitive uh, measure against the economy of South Africa. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a disincentive, in fact, for countries to actually report their variants because it's to their disadvantage. And I think that's a bad thing. I think we do need to have openness, we need to have transparency in science, but it needs to be, I think any kind of uh, reaction needs to be measured and based on scientific evidence, not on political motives. Well, joining us now from Pretoria, South Africa, to discuss the sharp rise in infection in this country and what is being done to contain the spread of the virus is Professor Ramnik Aluwalia, a physician and health systems policy and management specialist. Professor Aluwalia is currently the CEO of Higher Health, 
and a global public health specialist in charge of health, wellness, and development programs in Southern Africa. Welcome to the show, Professor Aluwalia, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Well, uh, Professor Aluwalia, um, I'd like you to just do two things for us. Give us uh, a full picture of what is going on in South Africa in terms of the prevalence of the new variant, because we understand that Omicron has now displaced uh, the Delta variant as a dominant variant in South Africa. And a picture in terms of uh, responses, policy-wise, and all of that. And then secondly, uh, why should we be, uh, how worried should we be about Omicron? How worried should we be, really, as a global community? Well, thank you very much. You know, um, uh, the last two weeks have been quite um, uh, critical for uh, Southern Africa and South Africa in general and for the entire world. Uh, um, this is a variant of concern uh, and no doubt, you know, you've seen uh, about 32 mutations uh, in the same uh, um, variant, which we have, haven't seen so many mut mutations uh, in the past, the way we have seen in one mutation. Um, in one variant, which definitely alerts us to um, a, a, a concern that we have. But I'm going to put a caution to say that there is no, um, there are no signs yet for panic, and as much as there are absolute signs for us to be concerned about. And that's the difference which I will try to explain to you what we're seeing in Southern Africa and specifically in South Africa. So this new variant, which is uh, Omicron, uh, is basically um, a variant that absolutely has now showing as much as it's still one week of data, but it's very clear that this variant is highly transmissible and more transmissible than its sister peer, which was Delta, which was considered to be one of the most transmissible variant in the COVID or in the coronavirus that, we, that the world ever saw. Uh, the, the early studies have shown 30 times more transmissibility. Uh, we yet have to identify a proper data sets to give us exact amount of, but clear indications are it is far more highly transmissible comparative to it. So what happens is when the virus is highly transmissible, it, it moves from one human to the other far more quickly. And when it enters the human body, it releases a huge viral load quickly and makes it far more transmissible because it starts binding to the human body cells faster due to the spike proteins and mutations it's showing. But on the other side, what we have also started seeing is that the same COVID variant, again, it's early data, predominantly from the young South Africans because they were the first cohort that we are seeing who are reporting to our private practitioners who are going to the hospitals and reporting and testing the cases of COVID-19 on this new variant, that they are not showing severe symptoms. So they are showing mild symptoms, which shows, which gives us an indication that there's a possibility that the virus might have reduced its virulence. Again, it's early days, because this is purely data from young people coming, which is the first cohort of rapidly rising infection in Southern Africa. We still have to wait how it will respond to older generations and to generations that are in middle or with co-comorbidities and how they will. But definitely from the first early symptoms and signs of one week of, of our understanding of this new variant, it is milder and that is why there is still not issues of panic from the public perspective. However, we will definitely are seeing a rapid rise of infections. Clearly in Southern Africa, what is clearly coming out is that this virus has dominated already in Southern Africa in a very quick pace. That the spike of our infections in the fourth wave are far higher than we saw in the third wave through Delta variant or through a beta variant that caused our second wave or the original coronavirus that came into South African shows in the, in the early March last year, uh, we have clearly seen this is absolutely faster transmissible. It has got high domination effect. And currently, 80% of people who are testing positive on COVID uh, is, are from the new variant, clearly showing that it has clearly dominated over the Delta. And that is the prediction for the world, 
That's a prediction for Western Africa, for Central Africa and the entire um, uh, uh, the, the global uh, continent that when it will move, it has shown clear domination effect on the, on the previous variants and, and its high transmissibility. Yeah, we will take uh, a short uh, break and then when we return, the conversation will continue. Please stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. We still have Professor Ravek uh, Adewalaya, a physician and health system policy management specialist. Uh, he's currently the CEO of Higher Health and a global public uh, health specialist in charge for health, wellness and development programs in South Africa. Uh, so we've been able to get a background to this. Then how is South Africa and the, how should the world then tackle, you know, the Omicron uh, variant? Are the travel bans scientific? Is that the way to go? Or going back to those non-pharmaceutical methods like wearing your face mask, and washing your hands and the likes, and is the health infrastructure world all over ready for this? So definitely, I think it's a very critical question that you've asked. Um, now, uh, let's, let's look at the, the physiology of this virus. The virus is still a coronavirus and it moves from one human to the other, which means we need to find transmission rates of blocking between one human to the other for the virus to move. Um, and, and that's exactly still remains the same even if we have a new highly transmissible variant. Uh, I, we as South, Southern Africa and Africa in general uh, are quite unpleased with the way the Western world has treated um, as they've always done to the African continent by sidelining us or punishing us for being absolutely honest and, and coming out. This is not an African variant. This is not a variant that is just because our genomic sequencing from one of our leading scientists in Africa detected it does not mean that this variant did not exist, existed in Africa. It could have existed in any part of the world and came to South Africa and found a faster transmission rates. Africa is a young continent. South Africa is a young country. Our median age group is 27 years old. Africa is a very youthful continent. And this new variants are showing affinity to young people, which means they move very quickly from one youth to another youth because youth are fragile. And they have shown behavior that was loosening up both in South Africa and every part of the world. And youth, people, youth are in South Africa are the unfortunately the non-vaccinated people. So because they are non-vaccinated, behavior is changing and they are young. The virus is finding an easy transmission way of moving from one human to the other very quickly. And that's why we're seeing spike of uh, infection. So there are four variables that are actually causing the fourth wave in South Africa. One is the Omicron, which is one variable. The second one is young people. The third one is behavior and fourth one is vaccination and because the vaccination rates are low among young people the viral load in the human body increases so much that the transmissibility is far more than a vaccinated population where the immune system overshadows the virus when it enters the human body so it is absolutely unfair for the world to have put uh, such kind of impositions to anywhere in Africa or, or South Africa for being honest and, 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 being, and, being, um, and being blamed for this variant, which is absolutely ridiculous. We also point out that this is, uh, that, that what everybody has to watch out is the same uh, what we did when the Delta variant happened. So when we saw the Delta variant that we first discovered in India and it spread very rapidly and became the dominant variant all over the world, the world accepted Delta variant and started putting every system in health uh, development towards in every country in order, whether it's non-pharmacological non protocols, whether it's health system strengthening, and it, whether it was slight lockdowns if in case the population's infection rates and virulence or severity of infections or hospital overcrowding is happening were imposed. The whole world has to deal with it. It is absolutely unfair to block flights thinking that this virus is originating from South Africa and it's only moving from uh, South Africa to uh, say to other part of the world. 
it's already existing in other parts of the world. It's just taking time for it to mature and 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 transmit more. Uh, and 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 that's exactly what the world has to discover. So I think uh, exactly how the Western world uh, treated Africa continent when it came to vaccine distributions, vaccine equity, uh, and the West needs to realize the same thing that if they do not look after Africa now, there is high chances that the non-vaccinated people in, in our continent will continuously transmit the virus and the virus will move from one human to the other, find a human body which is immunocompromised, sit inside, turn and mutate and develop a new variants. That's how we have seen 50,000 variants and out of which we have seen about five variants of concerns and there can be a sixth variant of concern if majority of the public in the world is not vaccinated. And so leaving African continent away will be harmful for the same West who will keep on uh, putting such a non-scientific based impositions to our world. Well, I mean, on uh, travel restrictions, I don't think anyone could have put it better than the UN uh, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who would refer to the travel restrictions, particularly uh, against uh, Southern African countries as travel appetite. But now President uh, Ramaphosa has been talking about vaccination and encouraging people to take the uh, vaccine, to take the job. Uh, how much of a problem is vaccine hesitancy in South Africa? So we do have, um, we just have about 20% of our young people vaccinated and that's where the biggest hesitancy is coming. Um, um, most of the young people, you know, we, according to our studies in South, South Africa, it shows 60 to 70 percent of South Africans already were infected with either the first wave of coronavirus, or the second or the third wave of coronavirus. And um, as much as they got infected, many and the chances of young people having milder infections or asymptomatic is extremely high. So that kept on making them understand that, well, do they really need a vaccine? And also, we also know as young people, young people do not like to go to clinics, they do not like to go to hospitals, and they do not like to get vaccinated. They will only go to health when it's the last condition. Uh, so in South Africa, we have a very severe a program focused now on the youth. Our population groups of vaccination in the middle age group and the older is going extremely well. We are crossing our 50 to 60 percent mark in that cohort of population, and which is maturing on day to day basis. There is vaccine hesitancy in that age group, but I think we are far better. Where the focus for Africa and South Africa will always be is the young people. Because when the youth is to be spoken about in the continent like Africa, which is a youth continent, this population will actually decide the trajectory or the reality of our pandemic. So South Africa, like any other African nation, is facing hesitancy from the same cohort which America is facing, which United Kingdom. But because we are a predominantly youth continent, uh, we face the numbers far smaller in our vaccines versus the population comparatively in other parts of the world. So the strategy for Africa has to be youth. Uh, if, you, if you really ask me what's going to decide the, the fate of COVID in the future for the entire globe will be the young people, because if they don't get vaccinated, the, vac the, the, the chances of mutations and transmissibility of the virus continues to make the virus find those human bodies where it finds those mutations, it finds to escape our immunities, and all the vaccine immunities or immune systems that we are building start getting escape, reinfections will start happening. And that's what we're seeing with Omnicon right now in South Africa. And I think that's where South Africa is trying its absolute level best is to get the youth vaccinated. So questions, they have multiple questions. We have seen one third of the young people in South Africa very much wanting to get vaccinated. So we are pushing that immediately. And I think we are almost there. The strategy is to the middle one third, the middle one third students or young people around the country, which are youth, wanting to get vaccinated, but they have questions. They want to ask whether we will reproduce, whether our testicles will be enlarged. They have genuine questions from their youth perspective. So what we're doing is we're trying to myth bust, we're trying to engage as much as they're reading social media, who's influencing them. But we believe that if we can get that middle one third quickly, 
we will reach close to about 70% of our population of youth vaccination. And then the last one third, which we know are fully under the anti-vaxxer influence, maybe through the majority two third, we'll get a peer to peer influence and we'll start converting. The last part is mandatory vaccinations or regulations. And if we fail eventually in all things, we might have to use regulations to get into that. All right, let me just have uh, three, three quick insights. Number one will be, when will COVID outmutate itself? Because when you check the 1918 pandemic, that was what happened in the end. The virus then outmutated itself. When will that happen? Secondly, I'd like to ask, uh, what's happening to the fill and finish you know, factories in South Africa? How is that helping with the vaccination drive, producing vaccinations you know, on the African continent. That's another one. And thirdly, uh, when will there be a frontal form of solidarity among African states in the fight against COVID? Because we don't see a lot of that. It's still a lot of silo effects. I don't know, maybe South Africa is shaking hands with what's happening at the Institute Pasteur in Senegal. When will that solidarity come? I think they're very pertinent questions. Uh, absolutely, I think in all interrelated questions. Um, the first question to answer you is, um, I think uh, f from the early signs, just very early data that's coming out from Omicron variant in South Africa. Uh, please don't judge me because data needs to come and more scientific evidence will prove how Omicron actually leads scientific world to understand this variant. But from the very early signs, the virus is now becoming highly transmissible. It is showing escape mutations, which means reinfections are highly possible. But the most good sign that we might see is that it's reducing its virulence, means it's reducing its severity of the disease, which means it's still mild infection. And if we follow how viruses behave in general, um, usually viruses come exactly becoming highly virulent, highly transmissible, but start losing their virulence. Is this the first sign for the world? Should Omicron come from the first few, first week of data that we have seen, be the possibility of us finding some hope of us coming out of COVID-19 gradually? Are we tapering down in our bar chart or our bell, bell chart towards now, towards a decline of how the COVID will? One thing is for sure, Omicron will infect millions of, of, of the people in the global world. It's highly transmissible. A lot of reinfections are gonna happen, but vaccine immunity is clearly shown at this stage to work for severity of the infections. And it has clearly shown towards in reducing hospitalization because it is very difficult for even current variants to find escape to our T cell immunity, which is built through the vaccines. So severity of the infection is where we are winning through vaccines. Plus, hopefully, if we are looking this new variant losing its virulence slightly means that the world is looking at a brighter side of COVID should the early signs of the data coming from South Africa is showing it. It can be totally changed once the older generation and the people with comorbidities and unvaccinated people will start showing hospitalization and deaths in South Africa. So far, our current deaths are still from our Delta variant and not from the new variant. So there, there is hope. The scientific world is watching that space very quickly, but you don't. You, but one cannot say for certainty at this moment. Your second question: Africa needs to build vaccines in Africa. Our genetics are different from the Caucasians, from the Indian communities, from the from the Asian community, from other parts of the world. Which means the vaccines needs to be tested or vaccine needs to be developed through proper research and development on our genetics, on our population, not just for COVID, but for many other epidemics that are centered in South in Africa. We have many epidemics and endemic zones where we have our own challenges and health system, whether it's bacteria, whether it's viruses, whether it's pathogens that infect our continent. And we can only win by not being dependent on the West or the East but us as ourselves. So it's, uh, it's, COVID is a wake-up call 
it has pulled nations like like uh, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Egypt to and in every nation to gear up our own African research agenda on health and vaccine agenda. If that doesn't transform, we will always be on the mercy of the West and we cannot be. And we have to guard our own continent together. And that brings me to your my question to answer to your last question, which is absolutely interrelated. If Africa doesn't unite as one, we will never win any health or a social challenge that we have been inheriting from our colonized world that we have. We are an unfortunate continent. We are not as privileged as other world. We only building our generations of economic dividends now. Most of people who are around in the same age group like you are and I are, are age groups which have come out of, of, of suppressions, which have come out of single parents, which have come out of poverty and disprivilegedness. And only this is the population that needs to now ha have suffered, but try to come together and say, okay, how can we build the next nation or the next generation who might be from parents who will have money, education, infrastructure and health, and they might not be in a situation we are. And that can only happen through a common African agenda, where means we do not put patents on vaccines or medicines when we develop in South Africa or in Africa or in Nigeria. We share with each other. We learn to, to respect each other if Western Africa is producing a vaccine, let's South Africa open its door and Southern Africa and say, test uh, a pilot on us to see our genetics work for your trials and maybe we can share and work it together around it. Working in isolation will only kill Africa together. We've been already been suppressed for so many generations. We are clearly seeing how the West is also are making things happen for us in the form of equitable vaccination possibility. WHO has been out crying, United Nations has been out crying that let's make vaccine distribution equitable. But the West needs to understand and, and, and Africa needs to say that we need to put a united front when it comes to vaccines, when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to research and development. So I think solidarity from Africa, this is a wake up call to African Union. It's a wake up call to WHO in Africa in African region, that this is the time for us to understand that we have to build our own surveillance systems, our own research and development systems, our own vaccination systems, so that we become independent. And we probably rather lead the world because what we can understand from our population, we have a lot to give to the world rather than take from the world. Well, Prof, I like your optimism about uh you know, Omicron not turning out so badly at the end of the day. But the truth of the matter is that it remains a great unknown so far. We're told that scientists are racing against time to determine its severity, its transmissibility. What if at the end of the day it turns out to be really bad? Will you be recommending uh, social restrictions? Uh, should we be expecting the possibility of another round of lockdown? Uh, a deepening of uncertainty with implications for the global economy? Because it's a variant of concern already and it's spreading extremely fast at this moment and is highly transmissible. In, in a week, it has shown domination, 80% dominant over the previous variant. It automatically alarms any world in South Africa to start looking at uh, possible lockdowns and most importantly, advocating um, social distancing, ventilation because uh, it's an airborne disease it spreads through aerosols so there we all know that we have to have well ventilated rooms uh, avoiding crowding um, ensuring mask wearing so all the necessary urgent protocols that we did for the first wave or the second variant or the third variant if this is a time and uh, we're going to lose out if we don't and not only in south africa but the entire african continent or anywhere in the world so the variant of concern raises this alarm immediately. Yes, if our hospitalization levels remain low, if our death rates remain low, then at least we can survive our businesses continuity by not imposing, imposing those type of lockdowns like we saw the panic that the Western world did to South Africa, which was not necessary. This is only if we see the virus changing its shape 
to what we can see in its worst phase. Early signs are not showing that, but we cannot depend on the early signs. But let us watch before we start disturbing things in a quick, in a panic way or trying to put ourselves into a panic mode. So I think at this moment, the variant of concern points towards a risk, a protocols tightening, government strengthening um, uh, issues of, of, of mask wearing, distancing, informing public, informing the public of not crowding, making sure ventilated rooms are possible, all the changes necessary in our policies that allowed during the lockdown one, which made many, many people come in congregations together, whether it's churches, whether it's schools, whether it's colleges, needs to be relooked very quickly because there is a high possible variant of concern, which is highly transmissible. But from lockdown perspective on business continuity, not yet, till we see uh, its impact on our hospital overload or its impact on our um, death rates, which obviously will only come from little data we will see going forward. Well, thank you, Professor Aluwale, for joining us. Thank you very much.